This video is brought to you by our patrons. If you want to make sure we can create more content like this, consider supporting us on our Patreon. Thank you. Hello and welcome to another chapter of Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy by Schumpeter. This chapter, this chapter is called Marx the Teacher. In the last chapter, we had a basic view of Marx's theory. We can find that the sum of the components of Marx's theory is worth more than its individual parts. It is the stroke of a brush that is painting the wild jumble of social life. Such analysis conveys not only richer meaning of what all economic analysis describes, but it embraces a much broader field. It draws every kind of class action into its picture. Wars, revolutions, legislation of all types, changes in the structure of governments. In short, all of the things that non-Marxian economics treats simply as external disturbances do find their places side by side with, say, investment in machinery or bargains with labor. Everything is covered by a single explanatory schema. Marx's theory, therefore, becomes a combination of the sociological and the economic. Thus, the economic category labor and the social class proletariat are, on principle at least, made congruent, in fact identical. Or capital in the Marxian system is capital only if in the hands of a distinct capitalist class. The same things, if in the hands of workmen, of the workmen, are not capital. So what downsides might there be to synthesis in such a theory? Well, it runs the risk of losing just as much in efficiency as it gains in vividness. The loss in efficiency or exactness when describing the groups or actors involved and the roles they play, etc., may unfortunately result in lowering the quality of both our sociology and our economics. And this is why such synthesis is so difficult and so seldom attempted. As we read in the quote a moment ago, Marx encapsulates quite a bit in his theory, like historical events, wars, revolutions, and legislative changes, and social institutions, like property, contractual relations, and forms of government. While other economists were treating things like this as events they could look at the consequences of, the economic consequences of, but they were not looking at the causes of these things as things that could be economic. The unique thing about the Marxian system is that he incorporated them as variables rather than mere data, therefore incorporating them into the actual explanatory process of economic analysis say war, were no longer independently caused events, but results, say, of class warfare, attempts of revolt against exploitation, of accumulation and qualitative change of the capital structure, of changes in the rate of surplus value and in the rate of profit, etc. Many things that were once random and out of our control can now be wrapped up neatly in a single theory. What a tempting thought. Once more, nothing is easier to understand than the fascination exerted by a synthesis which does for us just this. It is particularly understandable in the young and in those intellectual denizens of our newspaper world to whom the gods seem to have granted the gift of eternal youth, panting with impatience to have their innings, longing to save the world from something or other, disgusted with textbooks of undescribable tedium, dissatisfied emotionally and intellectually, unable to achieve synthesis by their own effort, they find what they crave for in Marx. There it is, the key to all the most intimate secrets, the magic wand that marshals both great events and small. They need no longer feel out of it in the great affairs of life. All at once they see through the pompous marionettes of politics and business, who never know what it is all about. And who can blame them, considering the available alternatives? But apart from this phenomenon described, what does Marxian synthesis amount to? Let's analyze this 
by looking at two examples which can help us parcel out the merits and demerits of Marxian synthesis. The first of two things we will look at is the Marxian theory of imperialism. Now it's worth noting that this has its roots in Marx's writing, but a lot of this part of the Marxian theory was developed by Marxist economists, other people, uh, later on. So don't freak out! <laughs> so because capitalist society cannot exist without profits, and because by its very function, profits are always being eliminated, you can look in the description for the full quote on this, but basically because over time, wages tend to rise and work hours tend to shorten, the system will therefore begin to seek out new lands of exploitation, i.e. countries where they still have labor that can be exploited and where the process of mechanization in their industry has not yet gone too far for the purposes of another country getting to exploit them. This process will begin with what we can call the bourgeois country, moving equipment and capital into the country they're colonizing or taking control of. Um, I'm gonna call them the lesser developed country. So the bourgeois country will move equipment and capital into the lesser developed country as a way to begin to establish their economic links and industry there. And this will often slash always lead to political subjugation as well because the natives of the country they're coming into might be like, what are you doing here? And also, why are you exploiting me? But also because the bourgeois country or the capitalist country wants to protect their investment from competition with other capitalist countries. This imperialism is viewed as a stage of capitalism by Marxists, Marxists and preferably the final stage of capitalism. It coincides with a high degree of concentration of capitalist control and a lowering degree of the competition which gives rise to small and medium-sized firms. But eventually via development etc this outlet for capitalist exploitation will eventually dry up and with nowhere left to turn chaos will ensue between the bourgeois capitalist countries themselves but also through pesky things like wars of independence and between the capitalists and the proletariats within the bourgeois countries themselves. Now, according to Schumpeter, this will nicely fit everything we know about history if we are just looking at the surface of history or hardly understand anything. For instance, when we look closer, we can see that the countries doing the colonizing were at an earlier stage of capitalism when they started doing this. So this idea that they had to go elsewhere to find new exploits starts to become questionable. Additionally, in the time of Schumpeter's writing, these capitalist countries have become less monopolistic than they were before, again countering the theory. Now, the other leg of the theory, class struggle, is in no better condition, particularly, and most importantly, in terms of it playing a causal role in the development of colonization slash imperialism. So after all this, what remains for us to look at is the neo-Marxian theory of modern protectionism. This basically states that Big businesses will buy for protectionist policies in order to maintain higher prices at home and to maintain their monopolies. But if our goal is to understand the phenomenon of modern protectionism, then this view is inadequate. For instance, the consistent support given by the American people to protectionist policy whenever they had the opportunity to speak their minds is accounted for not by any love for or domination by big business, but by a fervent wish to build and keep a world of their own and to be rid of all the vicissitudes of the rest of the world. 
Synthesis that overlooks such elements of the case is not an asset, but a liability. And everything becomes infinitely worse when we turn our attention to the final leg of the theory, where the theory of capitalist export and colonization eventually degrades into a struggle of monopolistic capitalist groups with each other and also with their own proletariat. This sort of thing may make useful party literature, but otherwise it merely shows that nursery tales are no monopoly of bourgeois economics. As a matter of fact, very little influence on foreign policy has been exerted by big business or uh, by financers. The attitudes of capitalist groups towards the policy of their nations are predominantly adaptive rather than causative. Also, they hinge to an astonishing degree on short-term considerations, equally remote from any deeply laid plans and from any definitive objective class interests. Now let's move on to our second example for our analysis of the problem-solving power of Marxian synthesis. Number two, the inevitable breakdown of capitalist society and the inevitable emergence of a socialist society. A little tricky because the breakdown of a capitalist society can become right or wrong depending on your definition of breakdown. The inevitable emergence of a socialist society, though, is more concrete of an assertion. Although Marx was very clever to never give us a super clear definition or image of what a socialist society would look like, mainly that it would just be classless, <clears throat> self-destruction, the purely economic reasons why self-destruction would be inevitable, were discussed by Marxian economists, is found to be um, insufficient. They are insufficient explanations for why this must be. What can we grasp from Marx's actual writings? We can grasp the untenable argument that misery and oppression will only increase. But if we accept this as true, which should or doesn't, does that even ensure the breakdown of capitalist society? At least as Marxists perhaps mean breakdown. Is it possible that things can move in a different direction? Schumpeter says that viewing socialism as the only possible final destination after capitalism is a problem in and of itself. Unless, of course, our definition of socialism is any non-chaotic alternative to capitalism. Schumpeter says that even if it is the Marxian outcome that occurs, it requires a distinct action, meaning a choice, to move in that specific direction as opposed to other directions, rather than it being inevitable. This is not to suggest that Marx was saying people did, had to just sit back and socialism would, would happen. They felt, you know, that there would be a revolution. Obviously, that takes an effort. The way Schumpeter means it is that there'd be effort to make that choice as opposed to other options, which therefore, of course, means that according to Schumpeter, there are other options. And on that note, we wrap up this chapter. I am going to put additional quotes into the video description if you are looking for a little bit of more nuance to the sentences that I am saying. I hope everybody has a wonderful week and stay tuned for our next chapter of Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Bye-bye. Hey, do you hate all of the ads on our videos? Well, it doesn't have to be this way. There is a way out. We've decided that for every 10 patrons, we will turn off all of the ads on a single book. For example, all the ads on Dusk Happy Tall will be turned off. Currently, we're at seven, so if we just get three more, we can turn off the ads for an entire book series. And at 20, we'll turn off the ads for another book series. And we will allow our patrons to vote on which book gets its ads turned off. So if that sounds good to you, please consider signing up at our patreon.com slash cbchapter. Thank you.